is Bronze and Modern Gods. I'm John. I'm Richard. And we are glad that you are here today. We've got a very special show. We've got a wide-ranging, freewheeling interview with one of the founding fathers of comic book collecting, really, when you get down to it. Uh, mm -hmm. Chuck Rosansky, the founder uh, and legendary retailer from Mile High Comics. He's going to join us to talk about a whole bunch of things, his career, uh, how to tell when the direct market really started, what a Whitman really is, uh, <laughs> his fateful meetings with Marvel in the late 70s that created the direct market, all sorts of stuff we're going to hit. So definitely stick around for that. But first, if you are liking what you see, make sure you hit like, hit subscribe, hit that notification bell. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Bronze and Modern Gods. And let's get started, Richard, with our hot book of the week. It is... This week, it's Hulk number three. All right. Donny Cates strikes again. Um, I'm <laughs> chuckling because didn't we go through this in 2020? Yes. Yes. Four and Black Winter. If you don't know, this book is the first cameo appearance of a new Hulk villain that's being touted as Hulk's version of Null. If that doesn't scare you off, I don't know what will. Um <laughs> But you can't deny what's happening. Copies of this reg of the just the regular cover A were selling for fifteen dollars when this came out on Wednesday. God bless Ryan at Pulp Fiction, my LCS, for not gouging people and selling it at cover price. But I will say you got to check out the one in twenty five variant by uh, by Moore. It's an excellent cover. I think this is the villain. Uh, it might be his first cover appearance. It is already selling for thirty five dollars to sixty dollars on eBay already. But you know what we say about these things now with these modern books. Buyer beware. Right, Richard? Oh, yes. Uh, we, we've seen this in the past couple of years so many times this cycle with, like John was mentioning, Black Winter. Uh, I'm wondering about God of Hammers that we talked about last week. And now this week we're talking about the anti-Hulk. I, I, none of these characters, in my opinion, have proven themselves yet as being investment quality. So be very cautious when you speculate, because there's a difference between speculation and investing. Uh, so I, if you're interested in speculating on this character, I wouldn't do it too deep until you, we have more appearances of him, uh, just to make sure that it's, it's also a character that's going to be around for a while and not something that's just going to be in the dustbin of comic history. You said the magic word, speculate. You're speculating on this. So the true definition of the word speculate is you don't know if it's going to succeed or not. So you're, you're taking a chance. Uh, right. So this, this is no ASM 50, for example. <laughs> no. And it's funny that there was a bunch, there were a bunch of books that came out last Wednesday that just blew up uh, all immediately. Venom number three with that ASM 300 homage cover, Strange Academy 15 that had the first appearance of another character, and, and this book, and to a lesser extent, She Hulk number one, some of the covers. Mm -hmm. So last week for Marvel was a big uh, speculative week. Uh, we'll just have to sit back and see how it all shakes out. Uh, one person that probably ordered a ton of all these books is our guest today. Our guest today started selling comic books in 1969 at the tender age of 13 years old, Richard. He opened his first store in Boulder, Colorado in 1974. In 1977, he discovered a cache of beautifully preserved comic books, now known as the Edgar Church Collection. Using money from selling off parts of that collection, he invested in a warehouse where he headquartered his comic book mail order business, placing those iconic two-page spread ads in Marvel Comics in the 80s. Remember those? Oh, yeah, definitely. I used to use that as my own personal price guide because I couldn't afford an overstreet. Uh, <laughs> an, an industry leader. He was instrumental in helping create the direct market for comic books, allowing comic shops to purchase books directly from the publisher. In the years since, he has become a mainstay in the comic book industry, weathering trends, downtimes, uptimes. He deserves the title, truly, of comic book collecting and retailing royalty. Everyone, please welcome the founder of Mile High Comics, Chuck Rosansky. Hi, Chuck. Hi. Welcome. Nice to be here. Anything, Thank you. Anything inaccurate in that intro? Well, no. Uh, you know, I'm older than dirt at this point. And <laughs> when I started, they were printing comic books on rocks. Um, so, you know, uh, you know, uh, we, we, we knew the early guys as chiselers in a good way. 
thing. So, <laughs> uh, so what was what was the turning point? You know, as a kid, where you turned from a collector into a, a young businessman. Well, I had a friend who stole a comic book from me that was that was really hard to get. Um, actually, two friends they they uh, tag teamed me um, very cleverly. They came over to my uh, uh, to our our apartment. And uh, they brought a coverless comic with them. And then as they were going through my collection, they pulled out my Silver Surfer number one, which was the only copy in uh, Germany at that time. Oh, wow. um, and they slid the, um, the blank cover over my Silver Surfer one and then um, slid it out of my house. Anyway, I, I caught my friend uh, because I found it at his house later on. And uh, he offered me five dollars for it. Now, to give you a, a sense of perspective, um, Spider-Man number one wasn't bringing five dollars in those days. Um, and I, my mom had been a small-time coin dealer, and I had been involved in coin collecting and in stamp collecting for a long period of time. And the cover price on Silver Surfer one was a quarter, and here this friend of mine was offering me 20 times cover price for uh, a, a rare issue. And I was like, oh my God, there's something here. And this light bulb went off and uh, I started looking in the comic books and it turns out my friend had already been sending away for catalogs from some of the very, very early comic book dealers like Robert Bell and Howard Rogowski grand book center um if you go back to the comics from 1967 68 69 you'll see the very first of those um coming out and those catalogs were all of our price guides before the overstreet was published and so anyway the minute that i started seeing that there were catalogs that there were priceless i became determined to memorize all of those catalogs because this was a way for me to escape from my family. I, I lived in a very abusive um, situation, and I was looking for a, a way for someone who was as young as I was to make money so that I could get the hell out. And mm. uh, comics seemed like an escape for me, which is an irony, because now people tell me that you know, did you start reading comics because they were an escape? Well, I did, but not in the way that most people think. It was a very different intent that I had. Wow. That is interesting because uh, I kind of have a similar background where I took my passions and, and used it to make money to get the hell out of Ohio, and, yeah. and <laughs> California. So I, I, that resonates uh, a lot with me. How was it in those early days? Just start because you started off with doing ads in the RBCC fanzines, right? Yes, I started selling um, not comics but pulp magazines because in the early days I was still an avid collector myself. And I was dealing on the side. So what I was doing was I was buying pulp magazines um, from a friend who had access to several warehouses up in Denver. And then I was turning around and converting the money or trading with people for rare comics. And so I was selling comics, but I was also doing it initially to try and build up my own set. And I did eventually basically complete a Marvel set, I think. But that wasn't very many comics in 1969 or 1970. <laughs> but nonetheless, I, I pretty much had all of them except, I think, Hulk 1. Um, Hulk 1 was such a low print run book, it was always hard to find. Um, but those became the initial founding inventory for Mile High Comics when I, when I first started selling commercially, which was in um, February of 1970. So that would be... That's going to be 52 years uh, in a couple of weeks here. Amazing. So that first set wasn't for your personal collection. It was initial inventory. Yes, it became initial inventory. It, it, you know, I, when I, I started collecting over in Germany, and the thing to realize is that I, I was very, very poor. Um, my parents were getting by, but... Um, I think my dad at that point might have gotten a raise from 350 to maybe $400 a month. And he had child support of 100 bucks a month that he was paying to kids from a previous marriage. Um, so we were trying to survive a family of three on 300 bucks. And so my monthly allowance was a dollar. 
And that allowed me to buy the eight core Marvel titles that were being released each month um, and not a lot else. And yet, despite that, because I was even at a very precocious age, I was able to um, trade for comics. I would get particularly desirable ones and I'd say, hey, I need four for this one or I need three for this one. And I kept trading up. So by the time I left Germany, I owned over 3,000 comic books on an income that was basically nothing. And so I was avidly dealing when I was 13, 14, well, 12, 13, 14 years old and uh, quite successful at it, actually. Amazing. So can you can you tell us about discovering that first Mile High High collection? Sure. Um, You know, I've written a 17 part um, complete history of it, which is on my website under a, a small link called Tales from the Database. That and was a column. We will link to that in the description below. Right. Oh, cool. Yeah, that, that was a column that I wrote for the Comics Buyer's Guide. And uh, that was really a turning point in my life because that, that column, um, I wrote, I think, 170 essays that I, that I wrote for that column. And prior to that point, there really had been an enormous amount of antipathy towards me in the industry because um, I was sort of seen as as the ultimate in the way of hustler and price gouger and opportunist. And it wasn't until I was able to lay out in prose some of the mindset that went behind some of the actions that I took and some of the uh, efforts that I made You know, with the church collection, for example, the call that I got, which was right about this time, 45 years ago, um, the call that I got was was an inquiry about how much I would charge to haul all these comic books away because they were trying to sell the house (laughs) and they were in a big damn hurry. And uh, they had already been putting stuff out for the trash men and they were getting hit with huge tippage charges um, because it exceeded their limit at two or three cans. I mean, they were putting out the equivalent of a cord of wood per week, wow. trying to throw these things away that had belonged to Edgar Church, his most, most particularly his clip art files. Um, and uh, it was a horrific expense. So when the realtor called me up, he was trying to make his commission by getting the damn house emptied so that he could sell it. And so that was the first question that was asked of me. They had tried to get another dealer in Denver. He's passed now, so I can give you his name. His name was John Caruso. Um, He owned a a store by the state capitol that was called Colorado Comics. And uh, John had made a couple of home visits to buy collections and had not had positive experiences from that. So he came up with this policy that he would not visit people's homes. And so when the um, realtor called John, John said, I don't make house visits. They can bring them in here or I'm not going to look at them. And uh, so I was the second one that they called. And I just had this instantaneous feeling when I got the call that this was going to be a good one. How good? I had no idea. I mean, no one could possibly (laughs) comprehend how good it was. but it was something that I looked forward to with great anticipation. And uh, it was right about this day, uh, 45 years ago, that I, that I picked up the second load. It took two loads with my band to um, get everything out of there. And it was just one of those things where um, they were very eager to make a deal. I went in there and I, I took an overstreet with me and I said, you know, comic books have collector prices. And they said, we don't care. We just want them out of here. And uh, so we struck a bargain on a price. And uh, the only problem was is that the the amount of volume that was there turned out to be vastly more than what they had initially showed me. Because what they showed me when I got to the house and I went down into the basement, um, they had stacks of comics sitting all over the place. But they were mostly 1950s stuff and not in great shape and it was a real hodgepodge i saw ecs and ecs you know in those days were bringing three to five dollars a piece in in low to mid grades and uh, then they had a bunch of western and love comics and in those days those were bringing like a buck Uh um and uh then 
mixed in there, there were also some things that were like DC comics. And I think there may have been even maybe even one of the timely revivals like the, the Captain Americas that they did in 1954 or three or whatever that was and, and things like that. But for the most part, it was love, Western, crime. The average condition was about VG maybe. So, you know, when we made the deal, it was based on that stuff. But uh -huh. the, the as we as we finished concluding our price negotiations, it was at that point that they said to me, "Okay, but you've got to also take everything that's in the closet." <laughs> and that was the moment at which it was like, "What? What closet?" And they opened up this walk-in closet, and it was not immense, but it was it was big, and there were comics in there that were stacked two layers deep. And they were from the concrete floor all the way up to the rafters. And there were even some stuck in the rafters. And uh, I looked at them and I was like, oh, my God, because they were all thick. And they were pure bone white, except for in the small places where a few of them weren't stacked quite precisely. And there were some little shadow lines. Um, but for the most part, these comics were clearly old. I had no idea of how old per se, um, but they were definitely older than the comics that I had been looking at that were piled on the stairs and piled on the floor. And so the, the, the way the, the famous story goes is that, you know, even though I was only 21 years old then, um, I'd already been dealing for seven or eight years and I had purchased hundreds of collections at that point. And one of the things that I learned is that you got to keep your cool. You never get a hard on for your comics, okay? And you can bleep that out if you want to. No, but that's totally the appropriate. First rule, okay, I'm just telling you, that's the first rule of being a dealer is that no matter what someone shows you, it doesn't really matter. Like I had someone bring in a Spidey one the other day, and, and it was a nice one. It had a lower staple that was almost detached. Um, but it really comes down to monies. Okay, how the hell much do you want? And he wanted ten thousand, and I was willing to pay eight thousand, um, which I'm really glad he decided he didn't want to take because I don't think I'd pay him eight thousand today. Because now that crypto and the stock market are getting a little weaker, um, yeah. I don't know if there's quite as many whales out there as there were three weeks ago. Um, and so you, you you always have to adapt, and you have to you have to look at things pragmatically. Um, but you don't let yourself get crazy about anything. But the one thing that I did that, that certainly indicated a degree of stress was I asked them after I saw this closet, I asked them for um, a glass of water and I'm looking at the closet and I go to drink the water and I pour it right down my shirt because I, I, I'm just so focused on these comics that I, I just can't believe what just happened to me. And I wish that I could say that it was by design. And, and there are people who have um, tried to vilify me and said that this was all right. a, a, a glorious attempt on my part to, uh, to rip off the church heirs. But no, no, no. I, I even offered to them to carry them on consignment. And I said, you know, I'll sell them for you and we'll split the money 50-50. But this is when we were looking at the cheap shit. OK. Yeah. And uh, but once the deal was done, the deal was done. Fuck that. No. Right. You right. Know, that that's the way it is. We made a deal. And uh, they're the ones that forced me to take stuff in the mm -hmm. closet. It's not like I put a gun to anybody's head. Right. And uh, so, yeah, the greatest comic deal that ever happened in the history of man happened with the, the closet door shut. Um, <laughs> interestingly enough, um, Church was smart. He had uh, padlocked this closet. And so they actually had cut the, uh, the padlock off. Um, you know, whether Church knew that the comics were um, collectible or valuable or not is something that, that I think about a lot. I did find a, uh, an article that he had clipped, I think it was out of the Saturday Evening Post, which said that old pulp magazines were valuable. Mm -hmm. And he actually had a large collection of pulp magazines, most of which I believe they threw away um, before I got there. I did get uh, quite a few. I got, um, I don't know, five or 600. But I actually didn't have the money to pay for those, so I turned them over to some people that I knew that were um, 
they dealt they dealt in pulps, but they they primarily dealt in crime fiction novels. So they sold a lot of first editions and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so I let them buy those because it was it was kind of a favor to them to to let them have them. I didn't really have the money. Um, to pay the church heirs, I had to get my friend Denny to uh, cash in a $10,000 CD that he had. And uh, best investment he ever made. Bitch didn't think I would pay him, but I did. Um, but the, 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 he, ended up, he ended up getting um, his money back out of the deal in church books at 40% of 1976 price guide. Now, I urge anyone who can find one. Um, to look at the 1976 price guide, I think Action One was three grand um, in the guide. Then, um, you know, uh, people tend to try and look at that collection through the lens of today, and oh I, my God! And it's like, dude, look at the collection in the in the lens of 1976. That's the price guide that was out when I when I got the collection, and uh, you know, a lot of those books were one, two, three dollars. Mm. In fact, I spurred outrage not the first time in my life but i i spurred outrage when i had a five dollar minimum price in near mint for 1950s books people were saying but it lists for two dollars in overstreet i said i don't care it's right. a it's it's it, it it this particular one looks brand new so i want five bucks if you don't want to pay five bucks then fine i don't care i'll just keep it and uh i had a five four three two one um grading structure which was that um, five dollars was the least I'd sell a, a near mint for. Four dollars was the least I'd sell a very fine for. Three dollars for a fine. Two dollars for a VG. Um, that was considered outrageous at that time. So um, I have suffered the slings and arrows. Of, um, <laughs> you, I, I, that, on your, it on just your, doesn't matter. On your tour video, uh, which I'll link to in the description as well. You make a very good point because that that's the you know the narrative mile high the prices are are outrageous but you have a specific strategy as to why can you share that with everyone that has not seen that video well there's a couple of different strategies one of the first ones and this is kind of an epiphany that i'm sharing with you that i really haven't even put out there yet which is that when you go back and you look in the at the ads in the Silver Age comics, Silver Age Marvels, 19, starting with 1965. The first one to really advertise was Collector's Bookstore in uh, Hollywood. And he had a bank vault that uh, he had multiple copies of Action Number One, Batman Number One, Superman Number One. He was notorious for not letting anyone in there that he didn't think was dead serious. And uh, he was one of the first ones in the nation to charge two, three, four hundred dollars for these um, key golden age number ones. But this is the epiphany. Um, he ran out of them. And why did he run out of them? He ran out of them because he sold them at less than the cost of replacement. There was the, the market mm -hmm. for collectibles tends to resonate on the basis of two things. One, availability, and the second one is where the prices are going in terms of the demand function. And uh, almost no one in this industry has been able to keep up with the demand function to the extent that no one has inventory equal to what they had 20, 30, 40 years ago, except me. Right. And that is because my prices have always factored in, what's it gonna cost me to go out and find another one and fully convey that cost, the, the cost of um, interest if I'm paying on bank loans, the cost of my carrying cost of keeping it in stock for however many years until I actually turn it, um, the cost of my labor. Labor has become an immense cost. Um, just sorting comics, which is what, by the way, I'm doing in here today. Um, I, I work seven days a week and I'm the fastest sorter in the company, so I do a lot of the company sorting now. But I have a, a you know, most people know that I have more than 10 million comics. It's, I think, a lot more than 10 million comics. Um, but we probably have two or three million at this point that still remain unsorted. But the rest of them are. And my sunk labor cost into having sorted those comics and gotten them into a, a, a database so that we can actually sell them, my sunk cost is 
probably far above five million dollars. Wow. And uh, people don't take that into account. They don't realize how damn expensive it is to um, organize and get things to where you can access them. Because a long white filled with random comics is like a, a, a colored cinder block. It, it has absolutely <laughs> no functional utility. It's not until you get those comics out and you sort them and you get them to where you can sequence them. And then if somebody comes in and they say, I want a Dazzler number eight and I can't afford a near mint, but I want a VG. You say, OK, I got a VG for you here right now and it's going to be four dollars. Yep. OK, if you want a near mint, it's going to be twenty two. OK, and, and and if you don't want to pay four dollars, then go to every damn flea market in the country <laughs> and go through their dollar books right. until you find one. That you're, you're paying me not for the rarity of a Dazzler number four in VG. Hell, there's there's lots of them out there. OK, you're paying me for the fact that you don't have to waste your time looking. And that's what I'm charging you for. But what I have to also cover then is my cost of keeping that available 24 seven so that when you decide that you're willing to cough up four dollars. Then I'll have it for you. And. I don't think that most people who deal with back issues really think through the economics terribly well. And that's why they say, oh, back issues aren't even worth bothering with. Well, they're not. There's a critical mass that you have to reach in terms of the number of units that you can stock. And right now, that is staggering in terms of how many different issues that you have to have. We offer something on the order of a million different variables on the website, and I think at any given point in time, we have four to 500,000 in stock, but it's a constant struggle to restock those issues that are missing. I Just this afternoon, I was taking a look at Superboy and the Legion of Superheroes from 220 through 258. Not a great run. Well, we no. don't have diddly shit in higher grades. They, they, they just sneak out. That's what happens is you, you, you don't raise your price because you're looking somewhere else and the rest of the world catches up with you and suddenly they're gone. Well, this is what happened with Robert Bell, who was the really premier Marvel retailer in 1968. Mm -hmm. It's what happened with Howard Rogowski, who sold the world's crappiest golden age in the same time period. Um, and it's what happened with the guys at Collector and Cherokee bookstores in L.A. They didn't keep up with the times. And keeping up with the times means that you get hammered because what does every fanboy want? Comics. Who's standing in between him or her and the comics? Me. <laughs> and so I become public enemy number one. Well, yeah, but I also provide a great public service because when you finally decide that you need that last issue, who are you going to call? Right. Right. And, and philosophically, you talk about the warehouse being a show place and that you want people to walk in and be just wowed by the selection. And that's tough to do if you're pricing aggressively, correct? Oh, my God. Yeah. If I wanted to sell everything in the place, if I wanted to, you know, drop all of my prices in half, which, first of all, would be logistically really hoard if we were to actually try to change price stickers because we have so many different objects that are in the store. Mm -hmm. um, but even if I, it, it, it's, it's a constancy where I see people walking around the store looking at their little phones, okay? What's this on eBay? What's this on the pop price guide? And it's like, I don't give a shit. I, I really don't care, okay? People bring in a huge box filled with pops and we say, okay, we'll give you $500. And they say, well, we'd really like seven. And we look at it and it's like, can we go seven? No, maybe we can go six. Okay, we'll go six. And uh, then we buy them and then we put them out for like 30 bucks a piece. And people say, but that's twice what the prevailing rate is. It's like, I don't care. Well, that's if you don't want to buy it, okay, get in your car, start driving. OK, I'm sure you'll find somebody somewhere that has it maybe even below the cost of the price guy. But there was a store three miles from here who listened to widgets like you and he's out of business now. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I don't particularly want to go out of business also. And I think this is super important. This particular store is intended to be a reinforcing mechanism for collectors to where you can bring your Aunt Matilda from, from Tuscaloosa in here and Matilda is going to get blown away because she's going to see the $30,000 FF1 as you walk in the door and then she's going to see unbelievable amounts of crap. 
<laughs> and 99% of it is not going to be of any interest to her. But I actually specifically structure the store so that it has an enormous diversity of things, such as old movie magazines from the 1930s and Oz books. And I mean, we just, like Friday, Pam bought an immense collection of My Little Pony stuff. Um, you know, I, not my cup of tea. But I recognize marketing and I recognize that as an institution, it's important that we represent pop culture of all kinds and that we be non judgmental. You know, I, I kind of keep the bondage stuff in the back, okay? But aside from that, you know, we're pretty, pretty open here. We try to keep it so that when someone comes in here, they all find something that they like. And our, our greatest problem, actually, I think we had 300 showcases like the one that's behind these um, six foot high showcases that have five shelves and a top. And they're all full. And they're just jam And like the, when the My Little Pony stuff came in, Pam had to pull something else out. But it keeps the store fresh. And I think that's also very important is that nobody wants to see the same movie. The biggest mistake that I think that most comic shops make is, is not realizing that they're an entertainment institution and that when people walk in the door, they want to be entertained. If you go into your shop and all you see is the same thing every time, then you, became, you become a brick buyer and the guy at the store becomes a brick layer. And you guys are probably wondering, what the hell is he talking about? What is a brick buyer? We have a subscription service. And people come in once a week and they get their stack of comics. Okay, well, we pre-wrap them. And so they come in, we hand them their brick, they walk out. Yeah. We've got 45,000 square feet of stuff. And these people are coming here on their way to the grocery store. Okay, okay they treat us like a commodity. Right. We're not entertaining them. Right. They're, we're just... A, a provider like the gas station the minute you get into that role you're screwed okay because if people don't view you as being entertaining and as being fun um then you've lost them and you suddenly just become a bricklayer you know yeah. you every wednesday is your big day saturday is maybe your next biggest day and after that you don't do squat you know you, you're swatting flies on mondays and tuesdays and uh trying to get away from that trying to create an environment we feel an obligation that when someone comes in that we have something new to show them that they weren't expecting. And so we have an open buying policy. We will buy any old piece of crap as long as we think we can get it at a price where we hope we can flip it at some point and make some money on it. And uh, you can only do that if you have an immense space. And I, I do have um, 65,000 square feet here in the building. But nonetheless, with that immense space, we're still struggling to get everything out and get it on display and being able to offer it to people. But that's our obligation because, you know, this store, all of us philosophically have to decide what's important for us in life. And I spend a lot of time ruminating on that um, because I'm at this point not because of the Edgar Church collection. I really have to emphasize this. Yeah. Um, the, this store, the, the, the Jason Street store, if I were to sell everything that was in it right now, I'd walk away with probably $5 million. But I own the building, which I would get another, after all, after all costs, I'd get at least another $5 million. And uh, then I have uh, another $5 million in Pueblo Pottery that I've got stashed away. And then I've got a farm in Boulder that's another $5 million. Are you starting to get the message here? I don't need demonies, okay? Mm -hmm. I do this because I really need a sense of fulfillment. I need a reason to get up in the morning. I feel mm -hmm. I need a reason to do something that's important and good. And I try every single day to do things that are good, that are magnanimous, that that don't involve money, that, you know, I spend a lot of time helping the homeless. I, I, I pass out a lot of food, a lot of clothes. I donate a lot of money. Um, and my goal is to be as constructive and as positive as I can. But part of that is this store, the Jason Street store, aside from being reinforcing for fanboys, I, I mentioned earlier that, that my own childhood was very unpleasant. And uh, essentially, I, I was raised by a stepfather who, who literally hated me and who s spent 
a disproportionate amount of his time tormenting me. And so I have zero happy memories from my childhood and my interaction with my male parent. And so what I really want to do is I created this store as a place for the young kids of Denver, the five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 year old kids to come in with their father or their grandfather or their big older brother or their uncle or whoever, someone who would bring them in here and they would have a moment together in the world's largest comic book store that then stays in their memory as a positive experience from their childhood. Um, the store's been here now for over a decade and so some of the kids that were coming in here when they were eight are now bringing in their younger siblings as they've become adults themselves. And uh, I think that is the coolest thing in the world, maintaining this store. And you know, bear in mind, this store is an offshoot of my own personal madness. Um, it makes no sense. I could rent this building. It's in a, in a highly desirable part of Denver um, for distribution and also for growing pot. And uh, I, I could make probably, and I'm, I'm being really conservative here, I could net out at like 20000 a month yep. just in that's rent awesome. from awesome. the building but if I, I didn't run Mile High Comics. And that would just be money in my pocket. But where would be the joy in that? Where would, mm -hmm. where would be, I, right now I'm doing something that no one else in the world can do right. because is, I have the unique combination of both resources and um, I kind of got the credibility. I've got, I've got the ability to do things. I can call somebody up and say, hey, you know, I'll take your $50,000 collection and I'll give you five grand a week for 10 weeks. Um, people don't even bat an eye. It's like, yeah, okay, we'll do it. And uh, nobody else really can do that. I mean, you know, maybe but, Steve Jeffy could or somebody, I don't know, but uh, most people wouldn't, wouldn't do that. Beyond that, though, this is such a great lesson for everyone because I'm a big proponent about following your passions right. and, and money will follow. Uh, I was a music fan, so I went, you know, I thought, well, how can I get into the music industry? And I did that and I, and I did well there. I love comics. So how can I use my knowledge and pop culture uh, experience to make money doing that? And this is a perfect example of that where you have someone that's following his passion and the money follows. It's such a cliche. It sounds easy to do when you just say it like that. But do you agree? Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, when we opened up the store, um, I got I to tell you, the store was a, was a happenstance thing. I bought the building because I was being evicted from another building that I had rented for nine years. And a new property manager came in and um, jacked the rent up by several thousand dollars a month. And when I protested, she said, you have seven days. I found someone else to lease your space. Get out. Wow. And I had 40 tractor trailer loads of stuff in that particular facility. And I called up the guy that had helped me negotiate the lease, a realtor. And uh, I said, Steve, you got to get me out of here. You got to you got to find me a place. I said, there's no way I can get out in seven days. So I'm already taking this witch to court. Um, but I said, you know, can you can you find me something? I said, the one rule is I don't want to be in Denver. Find me something in the northwest metro area that's not in Denver. So he calls me up the next day. He says, Chuck, I got this great building in Denver. <laughs> like, really? <laughs> really? And he said, no, he said you got to see this building. He said, um, these two guys own it. They used to own seven buildings. This is their last one. They've been stuck with it for a while. Nobody wants to buy it. A lot of people want to rent it, um, but nobody wants to buy it because it's on a dead end street by the rail tracks and kids have been breaking into it a thousand at a time and having rapes wow. in this building <laughs> and their insurance liability has skyrocketed and they really want to get rid of this thing and travel to Europe and have, have a good time. And uh, so I said, okay, I'll go over, I'll take a look at it. And uh, I walked into Jason Street and I had been in the building maybe 60 seconds. And I turned to the agent for the sellers and I said, okay. I said, um, will they make a deal with me? Will they, will they, do you think they'll carry the paper if I come up with a down payment? I said, I probably only need to carry it for like a year. But I said, will they carry um, 
the, the mortgage on the building for 12 months while I go out and scare up some permanent financing. And he said, yeah, they'd probably be amenable to that. I said, okay, we got a deal. I'll buy it. And he was like, you what? I said, no, I'll buy it. I said, uh, you know, you guys are asking 1.8. I said, I'll give you 1.6, 10% down. You carry 90% at, uh, I forget, I think it was 8% interest. And uh, you carry it for uh, uh, a year and uh, I'll go out and get on my knees and beg for a mortgage and I'll find one because there's money out there. And uh, he said, yeah, he said, they'll, they'll go for that. And I said, well, then here's what I'm going to do. I said, I'm going to go back to Boulder. I'm going to get my safety deposit box key. I'm going to go to the vault. I'm going to get out the very last of the Edgar Church books that I have, the ones that I kept for myself through all the travails well. of 40 years. <laughs> I, I'm going to go get the last of those books and... Uh, I'm going to drive them down to Heritage Auction, sell them off, and I'll come up with the 160 grand to give you guys down. And uh, Steve Borok was transitioning out of Heritage at that point, but Steve had told me if I ever needed money, just give him a call, and he'd work it out. And he did. He set the deal up. He he didn't end up being the one who who concluded the deal, um, but he set the deal up where um, they promised me if I gave them a complete Marvel collection that I had just bought in New Jersey and uh, my church books and uh, a bunch of Edgar's art that they would then turn into a uh, premier auction that in exchange for that, they would give me 160 grand. So I went to the vault. I got the books. Um, that was at noon on a Thursday, I think it was. And uh, I drove all night. I, I, I got in my car. I drove with my, my golden age and with um, my church art. Um, all the way to Dallas, and I went to the Heritage uh, offices, and uh, we cataloged in my books and my art, and uh, they said, oh, look at the time. It's after 7 o'clock. We'll have to mail you a check. I said, no. Oh. I said, I'll just take my books and go home. And they said, what? I said, no, no. I said, you know, I drove all the way down here to get a cashier's check for 160 grand. I said, I'll go home when I have a cashier's check for 160 grand. And uh, they gave me the money. Suffice it to say, however, that my dealings with them were less than ideal. And uh, I would not recommend anyone to um, follow my same path unless they know full and well in advance that they're going to get royally shafted uh, because no, no 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 all auctioneers are liars and cheats let's just be real clear about this we had a whole episode all right we had a whole okay. episode about this <laughs> yeah yeah so um you know but i don't hold them against them okay it's like saying you know all hyenas are carrion eaters i mean you know that's just like it's it's, it's a fact of life and what right. they do OK, and so I don't I don't have a problem with that. And at that particular moment, I needed to carry a needer to give me my goddamn money. Mm -hmm. um, and so I ended up making, you know, the uh, they've, they've got this building appraised right now at uh, eight point two million. That's the city of Denver does. And uh, I paid one point six. Do the math. <laughs> you know, I, you know, th so they screwed me. Uh, they screwed me and I knew they were going to screw me. And and. Uh, I still came out way the hell ahead. You got to pick the battles that you're willing to lose, I mm -hmm. guess would be the way to put it. <laughs> um, you know, that that particular mm -hmm. battle, I knew I was going to lose. I knew that it was going to turn sour. It did. Um, but at the same time, I figured out a way to still come out of it smelling like a rose. And really, that, that kind of defines um, my business career because people think that the Edgar Church Collection like put us into hyperdrive, and it really didn't. The, the deal that I did that was in 1985, which was the My, Mile High 2 deal, um, which was an immense warehouse on the East Coast that had um, affidavit returns in it, um, that particular deal made me easily 10 times wow. the gross revenue that the church deal did, 10 times, okay? I didn't make the money on the church deal. Guys like Steve Jeppe made the money on the church deal because they bought them and then sold them for 10 times overstreet and uh, i wasn't doing that i i i was selling them at 1977 1978 1979 overstreet and i was selling them typically at 1.5 i got pilloried for selling them at at guide and a half um you know now people are telling me 
oh my god chuck you really must have been just dumber than a brick to sell those <laughs> great comics for the so so little and uh, it's like no no i maximized what i could get in the marketplace at that time and then yes i reinvested that money but here's the important part i lost a lot of it because the comics business you mentioned in, in in your intro that there have been ups and downs and sideways there have been at least 20 times over the last 50 years when we have been one check away from bankruptcy because that's the nature of being an entrepreneur you you zig when you should have zagged things go wrong the industry goes to hell remember 9 11 i mean mm -hmm. you know the twin towers they shut the whole economy down yeah. um you know recovering from things like that now we've had the pandemic i mean things happen well as you can see chuck has a lot to say a lot to share much more uh, to come. This is going to be split up into at least a two-parter, maybe a three, maybe a four, Richard. Oh, man, so much. And I and I feel like he had so much more to talk about. Uh, well, well, just wait until next week, you guys. There's a lot more, uh, a lot of things to happen uh, yet in this conversation. You will be surprised uh, and hopefully entertained by what Chuck has to share with us. Yes, I had to say he's a great storyteller. I, I learned something. I definitely did. I learned that I'm old. Yes. And, <laughs> and um, you know, th th he's been doing this for longer than 25 years. Oh, uh, look at you queuing me up for our favorite segment, the 25-year rule. The 25-year <laughs> rule. This is when we go back 25 years, this time to 1997, to look at the books that came out then, some memorable, some not so memorable. This one is definitely memorable. Deadpool number one. After a couple of successful miniseries, The Merc with the Mouth finally got his own ongoing title. And I loved this book when it was out, Richard. Uh, it was a classic run written by Joe Kelly, who was one of my favorite writers. He was writing Daredevil at the time as well. He was writing a couple of X-Men books. He was fairly new, but this was his breakout title. It laid the groundwork for Deadpool, probably as we know him now, uh, the introduction of Blind Al, the breaking of the fourth wall, you know, Deadpool talking to the reader directly and referencing things happening. Uh, Deadpool in the 90s, though, Richard, I don't know if you missed this. I think this is when I you totally were, missed this. This yeah. is when you were retired. Okay, Deadpool in the 90s. Now, Deadpool now, we all know Deadpool. Hugely popular, right? Movies, series after series, spinoffs, Gwenpool, mm -hmm. uh, all this stuff. Deadpool in the 90s, however, was a book that was always just about getting canceled. Uh, <laughs> the letters pages at the time were like, Please tell your friends. Uh, we don't know if we're going to go past issue 25. We don't know if we're going to go past issue 30. We don't know. You know, it kept it kept this uh, groundswell for what was then a C-level character in a really tough time for Marvel uh, when you had to be at a certain level to, to be published. So they never really knew how long this book was going to last. Uh, at one point, Joe Kelly left because he was so frustrated with not, not getting any kind of support. And you had Christopher Priest come on for a run, Gail Simone. It, it did pretty well. It ran 69 issues before finally succumbing to low sales in 2002. It's hard to imagine Deadpool being a marginal title now, but that's how it was. You, you got to thank the you got to thank Ryan Reynolds for this. You know, he really he really championed that character for years until he made that little trailer. Mm -hmm. that uh, he that got leaked uh, that really just showed what he could do with the character. And I think uh, that was the real renaissance for, for Deadpool. He had been he had been in one of the Wolverine movie previously to that. But it wasn't until Ryan Reynolds really showed um, the irreverence and just just the action that could be made for the character that the comic book sales really started to spike. Yeah. Uh, now. Deadpool number one of the ongoing series, not as much heat as like the number one of the Circle Chase or the the very first Deadpool miniseries number one. It's actually kind of trending downwards. The last sale for a CGC 9.8 was for $178. That's down from 240 last year. But 
if you're on the search for this book, be aware there is a newsstand variant for this book as well. Now that we've been schooled properly on what the variants are by our friend Chuck. Uh, so Deadpool number one, been 25 years, man. Yeah. Now's the time. If you're interested in this book, now is probably a good time to buy. Get the dip. All right. Speaking of books that we are uh, encouraging you to check out, it's time for our underrated books of the week. Richard, what you got? My pick this week is a title called Afterlife with Archie. Uh, number one from 2013, 2014, the series ran. Uh, it's an in interesting book. This is by Archie Comics, who for decades has published a very um, innocent series starring Archie, Veronica, Betty, and a host of characters. This kind of took a dark angle at those characters. This is the first uh, series that was rated Teen Plus for the Archie universe. The story focuses around Sabrina the Witch resurrecting um, the dog of... Oh, poor hot dog. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. I can't remember Jughead's name for some reason. Jughead's name keeps <laughs> it eluding me. Uh, resurrecting Jughead's dog, Hot Dog, who, who gets hit by a car. Uh, oh. There's more story behind that, so I won't go into any more detail. Um, she resurrects the dog, and in the in the result, uh, resulting uh, resurrected dog is a zombie, and it bites Jughead. And then it's all the story about you know Jughead being patient zero of a gram, uh, a zombie uh, apocalypse, and it's you know it's a darker story. The characters get into situations that they would never ever get in with uh, you know <laughs> if Don Parent was actually um, doing the art and the story. So it's 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 really cool from that angle. Uh, this book, uh, uh, there are only 151 uh, copies of the A cover on the census. 112 of them are uh, 9.8. There's a rarer uh, New York Comic Con zombie cover, uh, which is it's pretty cool looking. It's it's harder to come by. It's it's about $300 on CGC census. The last sale that was in 2016, so it's probably more than that today. The GPA for the A cover is only $78, so it's not necessarily an expensive book. But there are other really great covers in this series. Issue number five has a great cover. Issue number seven, if you like Google Girl Art, and um, everyone knows I do, it's, <laughs> it's, it's just rife with these really, really cool covers of, of uh, the characters and situations. You would not see them in the normal Archie universe. Kind of a... Uh a groundbreaking series for Archie in a lot of ways, because this laid the groundwork for things that were not necessarily all ages. Uh, this, you know, people are like, Oh, oh at the time, Archie's publishing a book with zombies and, and horror. And you guys remember uh, in the fifties, Archie, uh, the, the parent company were publishing some pretty hardcore pre-code horror books along with Harvey comics. You know, uh, Casper was a real ghost back then. Uh, so Afterlife with Archie kind of laid the groundwork for what the Archie universe is now, which is more teen-oriented, young adult uh, novelization type stuff. And it kind of had to change. I mean, the, the the comic book reader is not the same reader that was reading uh, Archie's back in the day. So it's definitely something that uh, it's just an, um, a, a, the market changing and, and Archie Comics uh, being aware of that. Smartly so, because how long can we live without knowing what that tic-tac-toe design on the side of Archie's head is supposed to be in the first place? <laughs> All right. My pick for underrated book this week is Full Killer, number one from 1990. Now, you guys know, if you've listened to this podcast enough, you know, I'm a huge fan of Steve Gerber's work. He created Howard the Duck. Uh, he kind of made Man-Thing uh, the true horror book that it was in the 70s great run on defenders full killer is probably steve's last significant comic book work it was a 10 issue miniseries it featured the character who fancied himself a vigilante that was first introduced back in the 1970s during his original run on man thing and in omega the unknown now i'm not going to spoil things for you but this is a character that fancies himself as kind of like a punisher uh, he's going to take care of the fools in this world. It just has trouble defining what a fool is. Is it someone who jaywalks? Is it someone who kills 90 people? Um, I'll let you read it and I'll let you decide. It's kind of a really dark look into someone's psychosis. Um, it is a great story. It has a definite beginning, middle, and for sure a definite end. 
uh, highly recommended uh, read if you can find them. They're tough to find. I've been trying to build a run of Fool Killer, and I've, I've gotten a few here and there. But when you find them, they're not expensive. The last sale for CGC 9.8 was back in November for $67. So I can imagine raws are out there, and they should be plentiful. But who's bringing Fool Killer books to a Comic Con, you know, uh, unless you find them in the dollar bin or something? That's true. Uh, unless unless you know they know that you're going to be there, then then they'll yeah. shoot. Them. <laughs> is uh, this one that passed you by? Yes, completely. I have not I have not seen this. This is an interesting book. Yeah, they've revived the character a couple times since then for miniseries. You know, obviously different full killers. Again, no spoilers, but it would have been hard to bring this one back. Uh, so uh, it, it, none of them have kind of the impact that this original miniseries had. So if you're looking for a good read that's not going to break the bank check it out well that's going to wrap it up for this week we want to thank our special guest chuck rosansky from mile high comics for being here obviously the conversation went a little longer uh which was great so that means you're going to get a great part two with chuck next week where we're going to discover a lot more new information that we probably didn't know and we are going to have our uh bonus episode later this week so make sure you come back and check it out and we will catch you next time Yep, exciting. I can't wait to hear the rest of the story. Everybody stay safe.